So welcome to another great panel in uh, UT's 10th Social Media Week. I hope this intro video got you hyped up. That was my first time seeing it and I'm pretty hyped up and ready to go. Uh, so today's panel is entitled The Rise of Extremist Movements on Social Media, a conversation with the experts. And we have an absolutely superstar expert panel today. Um, and so I, I think this will be a great conversation. Uh, just to sort of frame what we're going to do, the goal of this panel is to discuss uh, extremism online and disinformation that may cause extremism online in the sort of point of context of the January 6th Capitol riots. Um, so we're going to use this as a point of context, but we're going to discuss it pretty broadly. So let me introduce you to our panelists. Uh, first, we have Dr. Jeremy Blackburn. He's an assistant professor of computer science at Binghamton University. Uh, this is a, a SUNY University in New York, a great computer science department. Uh, broadly, Jeremy's interested in data science, um, but you've, if you've ever looked up anything on alternative fringe extremist web communities, uh, there's a 99% chance you've ran into his work either in popular media or in academic literature. Uh, he has a huge amount of work on measuring online behavior in fringe communities. Uh, he's been covered by the Washington Post, New York Times, Atlantic, Wall Street Journal, a huge list. Um, so we're really happy to have him here. Our second panelist is Dr. Cody Bunton. He is an assistant professor of informatics at NJIT in New Jersey. Uh, he is also the director of the Information Ecosystems Lab there, where he studies social media and online political engagement. Uh, some of his early work is on crisis informatics and political engagement during uh, disasters and times of unrest, which is obviously going to be relevant to our conversation today. Uh, some of his more recent work has been on platform moderation effects. So in particular, he has some very recent work on uh, not just the effects of YouTube changing the recommendation algorithm on YouTube itself, but also on the larger ecosystem such as Twitter uh, and Facebook. And then last but certainly not least, we have Dr. Joan Donovan. Uh, she is the research director at the Sorenstein Center for Media, Politics, and Public Policy at Harvard. Uh, she's an adjunct lecturer in public policy in the School of Government at Harvard. Uh, again, she's another leader in this field, particularly in media manipulation and disinformation campaigns. Uh, I, and once again, you probably ran into her being quoted somewhere in popular media. She's been covered by NPR, Washington Post, a whole litany of uh, media sources. Um, one of the things that I think will be particularly relevant to this conversation is uh, the media manipulation casebook that her and her team put out. This is um, a really nice nitty gritty way to look at how does media manipulation happen uh, and what we can sort of do to understand that dynamic. So that is uh, our all-star panelists. I really thank all three of you for being with us today. And so we'll just get right into our questions. So uh, for my first question, I wanna sort of bring a quote that sort of inspired this panel. Uh, and this comes from another expert in this field, Dr. Kate Starbird in a recent Nature article, which if I remember correctly, I think Joan was also quoted in. Kate said that the storming of the Capitol on January 6th was quote, this physical manifestation of all these digital characters we've been studying, to see all of that come alive in real time was horrifying, but not surprising. And when Kate refers to these digital characters, she's um, generally talking about online personas of super spreaders of conspiracy theories sort of coming to life at the Capitol riots. So my question to you is, do you agree that this event or this physical manifestation of online behavior was not surprising as researchers? And uh, anyone can feel free to jump in here. I'm happy to kick us off. Um, I, you know, it's really, uh, it's a difficult position to be in because uh, I think methodologically, right, the data science approach takes the online world as seriously as it takes the offline world, but doesn't actually make those connections with where violence is touching down in people's lives, whereas the ethnographic approach actually starts from the other way, which is to say that there are people who are doing destructive things in public, harming people, 
And that's who we then go look at online to find out how are they getting organized and how are they doing their planning? How are they coordinating? How are they selecting their targets? And so for me, the, that quote would have come in the different direction, which is to say that the online environment, uh, this kind of wires to the weeds effect, uh, really impacts how public space, uh, how people come together, how our society works. And so from my perspective, it wasn't necessarily these digital characters had come to life. It was more that these um, several of them heinous individuals use the online media ecosystem as a means to an end, which is to cause damage, chaos um, in people's everyday lives. And, and so I, one of the things that I think our field actually suffers from is this digital dualism, this idea that uh, Facebook calls them real world harms. Uh, and I'm just like, well, what other kinds of harms are there? Uh, you know, because they are all real world harms. And it might come from a legacy of our generation, like getting, you know, kind of enculturated the internet through AOL, where you could be anonymous and you could, you know, play out different characters and identities and try on different things. And the stakes were a lot lower, but the stakes have changed, obviously. And the capital insurrection for me was just probably the grandest uh, example in the U.S. of what um, organizing looks like, uh, organizing for violence looks like, where where social media is part of that toolkit. Yeah, I want to echo what Dr. Donovan was saying. You know, from from past work in political science and radicalization, you know. There's a lot of work showing that political and media elites have a lot of influence in the real world. And you know, in that regard, it's, it's unsurprising that given the language and the rhetoric used by particular groups, that this could lead, lead to violence. That's not a new thing. Really though, social media and the online media ecosystem allows a lot of that to be amplified in ways that are, that are probably not great uh, societally but also allows people who otherwise may not ever have engaged or come across this kind of rhetoric or this, this community to then see it sort of incidentally and then have a very like easy radicalization, radicalization pathway there. It's like, we can't reach people who are already, you know, in the real world socially engaged with like core white supremacist groups. You know, it's difficult to like change their behavior. Uh, but if you are, you know, looking online for some particular topic that is about politics and then you end up seeing a lot of this content about you know, conspiracy theories or uh, hateful rhetoric that we know causes or can lead to uh, violence, you know, that sort of incidental exposure ends up being radicalizing in a way that old media or more traditional media hasn't had the ability to do. Yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and chime in a little bit. So the core question here is whether or not this was surprising. And um, I, I think that it wasn't surprising that something like this happened. It certainly is surprising to see the particular manifestation. I don't think many people at least expected there to be a storming of the Capitol, you know, this type of thing. But, but yeah, like this stuff exists and um, has in the past. It's not particularly new. Uh, but there are differences, there are meaningful differences now with the, uh, you know, the ubiquity of social media, where it becomes somewhat of a socio-technical problem. It's a little bit different. There's always been propaganda, there's always been conspiracy theories, but now you have the ability to use the dynamic, ephemeral, semi-anonymous nature of the web to kind of, uh, you know, mine people psychologically and, and may, you know, able to push people in certain directions that perhaps you weren't able to before. Um, that's what's kind of new about it and a little bit surprising that it had such a big and powerful effect really kind of fast. You know, everybody in this panel is well aware that this stuff was happening, uh, but I don't think the majority of the public really was. Um, yeah, so that's, I guess, kind of the new, the new aspect of it, right. in my opinion, at least. So, so it seems like we all agree, you know, at some level, 
it wasn't surprising, but maybe the specific event itself was an unusual manifestation of it. So I guess that, you know, it sort of already answered part of my second question, but do you think, you know, there's something different about this event, or do you think this was just another instance of accumulation of bad information online, you know, turned into uh, what we would say real world, you know, impacts? I can go and just add in that, um, you know, what's different is that you have a president calling for a wild protest, right? And that is, that is different, right? If, um, you know, Cody's research in political science is right, which I'm inclined to say, yes, it is that people listen to their representatives and act on the calls to action. And if you listen, you know, I've watched now hundreds of hours of some of the most boring live streams from that event, right? A lot of us are drawn into the, the very high intensity situations. One of our research methods is to take a step back and look at videos that had under a hundred views, but are different spots in the crowd where people are just wondering what's happening. I see something over there. Uh, that looks bad. What was that noise? Uh, you know, why did you come here? Essentially, some of them are like vacation videos in DC where they are coming to this event because the president wanted them to come uh, and they were told, you know, to walk from this place to the Capitol and that the president was going to meet them there. And so there are a lot of videos of people actually doing that walk um, from, from the, the president's speech to uh, the Capitol and they get to the Capitol and they're kind of surprised at what they see, right? Because they didn't expect what was going to happen. Um, but for us, it's, you know, as researchers, that banality, that everydayness of uh, how a president can call for essentially a, a coup uh, to prevent the counting and the certification of an election so that he can uh, kind of continue a reign of chaos, like that's mixed in with, you know, your tweets from your nephew and your uh, pictures of somebody's dinner. And so there's something about the banality of social media and the way in which the loss of context uh, where you're getting messages from the president and messages from, uh, you know, a secret government agent that is leaking secrets to you and people and others online matched with, you know, advertisements from your local pizza shop that um, it kind of creates an information environment where people are kind of picking and choosing between uh, what they follow and what they take action on. And for our research team, we've really cared about over the last um, several years, how misinformation at scale mobilizes. And when I say mobilizes, I say uh, what that means to me is when people take action that they otherwise wouldn't have taken. Uh, if not for receiving this information. And so people were not going to the Capitol on January 6th for, uh, you know, an event at, if Trump hadn't called for it, right? Mm -hmm. And so acting on misinformation, doing something else, especially when people are spending resources to do it. I know I sound like one of those boring sociologists that are like, well, when resources are mobilized, <laughs> you know, we got to pay attention. But we do, you know, and one of the things that was uh, actually kind of surprising was that Parler didn't have the kind of power that a lot of people are saying it did. It didn't have groups. People were using this other website called Clout Hub to organize ride shares because it didn't, uh, like Parler didn't have all the functionality of Facebook. Um, and Facebook was becoming a place where people felt like they were going to be taken down or it was going to be an unsafe organizing environment for them. And so you actually see all of these different net technologies plugged together, uh, kind of like an old <laughs> component based, uh, you know, stereo system <laughs> in order to kind of amplify the effects of this call to action. The last thing I'll say about what's kind of different about Trump as president versus Trump as private citizen is that um, because of his status, he was, he was protected from 
the terms of service in a way that made it really difficult for these platform companies to apply their own rules. And that to me shows that people in power are going to be able to flex that power in really damaging and corrosive ways, uh, especially because of the scale at which their messages reach the public and shape media agendas. And so uh, social media actually seems to favor uh, authoritarianism in, when it's like when the terms of service are applied in this way. And to me, that is uh, incredibly dangerous and is definitely high on my priority list as a, as a research topic. Have any, any thoughts to jump off of there, Jeremy or Cody? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a difficult problem. I, I definitely agree with that. And there's a lot of nuances here. Uh, it's like, I agree with many, with many of, 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 of Joan's perspectives and comments here. I'll, I'll make a distinction though about, you know, what is the role of misinformation when a person in power tries to mobilize people to come to a particular event. I mean, to me, that's not, a, that's not misinformation. That's, that's a, an individual who has an amplifying platform or an amplified platform calling out to his constituents or his followers in ways that, uh, like I said, again, aren't, aren't new. Uh, and there's, a lot of, there's been a lot of work on social media and mobilization about you know, what constitutes mobilization, what drives people to go out and protest. A lot of it's based on friends and like who your friends are, uh, but that's a social. That's a social aspect. That's not not specific to social media. But you also get media effects like um, showing you imagery, uh, photos, and video is actually way more mobilizing than showing you text. And when you see lots of of media coverage, and now with uh, like release of terabytes of video data from from the January sixth event, you know I, I think that that kind of mobilization and and like democratization of media production and rapid dissemination you get from something like Facebook Live or the, a lot of these streaming platforms is definitely a new media power that's not been available before. Like uh, authoritarian regimes using technology is not new. Uh, we see like in, in, the, Turk, in the, the Turkish coup several years ago, Erdogan used like FaceTime to engage with, with, uh, with the public afterward. It's like, that to me is not surprising and not, not hugely new, but definitely the ability for these people to basically escape any sort of gatekeeper and push this huge amount of, of media very rapidly into large audiences, especially audiences that are in a very general platform, like, like Joan says, who are just like looking at pictures of cats and, and your local pizza joints. They see that in a way that they would not maybe not have looked at before if they were just like flipping channels on, on the television. Yeah, I, I think that the comment about social media perhaps being authoritarian in nature is, is interesting. So we've done, for example, a bit of work on Parler in particular. And it's a good example of a, a platform, a community where you see that kind of the, the early adopters and the founders are really the ones that set the stage for the kind of, um, you know, uh, conversation and discussion that is and the the features that may you know push people towards authoritarianism uh, and that's an interesting point because if you look at twitter twitter yeah twitter has problems but twitter behaves in a certain way their content moderation policy is kind of geared in a certain way to to their early audience um, even though it is obviously a mainstream platform there's still a lot of tech orientation this type of thing like those are the big leaders uh, and so you have these things like parlor and these more fringe uh, setup sites, platforms that do grow big. And and the fact that Parler didn't support um, groups and that this Cloud Hub thing, right? So now, now you get, okay, well, what are the Cloud Hub early adopters and founders and like, what's their type of moderation policy? So I'm not sure if social media is inherently authoritarianism but, or th authoritarian, but certainly it can be steered in that direction. And the more things become fractured, uh, in this way, then that's where we're looking as towards maybe perhaps the like the deeper problem that just moderation policies in general won't be able to solve. 
So that's actually a perfect jump off to this broader question I wanted to ask. And, and before I ask it just to the audience, if you have questions, uh, feel free to put them in the Q&A box and we'll uh, definitely get to them at the end there. Uh, so one of the broader questions here is, you know, it's sort of been a long promise by CEOs of major platforms and researchers, et cetera, that to solve this problem and sort of related problems of hate speech, et cetera, uh, is that content moderation will save the day. And, you know, when I say moderation, I mean this very broadly, right? So removing repeated offenders, putting warnings on information, um, changing the recommendation algorithm, what have you. Do you think that content moderation is still the right solution to this problem? Or do you think it's maybe only one part of that? So I think there are two, there are two major issues at play here, right? One is the exploitation of these platforms by groups and individuals who have power and agenda. I'm not, I'm not convinced that content moderation alone can solve that problem. That's a societal level problem uh, that addresses like the full media ecosystem. Now, the other avenue here is this, this issue of, of incidental exposure. And for people who are maybe not radicalized or not, not, have not been exposed to this kind of, of information, or exposed to these communities where this information gets a lot of traction or antisocial information gets a lot of traction, then content moderation, I think, has a huge role to play in that aspect. Like you can't stop somebody from saying, well, you know, I don't believe in vaccines, so I'm gonna go and find communities that, that also don't believe in vaccines. You can't stop that person. In the same way that when I, I grew up in Alabama, you would, you would not want to stop some some young kid who's who's having gender identity issues and trying to come to grips with what their gender identity is from also trying to go find the like a community of people who support who support them i mean that you, you don't want to stop that person even though in alabama that would be considered a you know a super antisocial or or like like radical kind of thing uh, but definitely preventing people or pro providing some sort of moderation capability that increases the overall quality of the platform and prevents people from stumbling across this information. I think that has real value, uh, but it's not a thing that can be done alone. Like the platforms don't exist in isolation. Uh, so if one platform does it in isolation, sure, it'll have an effect. And we've seen this with YouTube's actions because YouTube is massively popular, uh, but that's undermined when Facebook and Twitter don't do similar kinds of things. Yeah, I'll say, that from a moderation is obviously part of the solution. It, it has to be like, like Cody was saying, it's, it's clearly part of it. It's also not the full solution. And from a technical point of view, it's, it may not even be possible to like deal with this from certainly from a purely technical standpoint. I, I don't think it makes sense to deal with it from a purely technical standpoint. Content moderation is inherently a reactive, uh, you know, thing. Um, and that's again, all well and good, but that's not how you fix a core problem. So you need some kind of proactive solutions. I don't know what those are. Um, and they're certainly very technical, technically challenging um, when you're dealing with this type of scale and the type, type of harm that can happen. And then there's also kind of ethical questions because whatever tools are built are going to be abused by bad actors. We've seen this consistently in in social media that no matter what you set up there's going to be some trolls that figure out a way to exploit it and cause problems so like cody was saying if there's some solution that can kind of push people away let's say from radicalization i'm sure it's going to be leveraged to also push them away from you know uh, help groups and in you know these type of things um so it, it's a really it's a tough problem and i don't i certainly don't have a solution for it i know that there's a bunch of stuff we need to try though. Um, it's not the end all be all. You can't just wash your hands and say, hey, we get rid of you know a bunch of Nazi stuff and now our, everything's fine. That doesn't work. Yeah, and we've seen that happen, um, you know, back in 2015, I was researching white supremacist use of DNA ancestry tests, I was looking at science and how they make their boundaries and distinctions. Most of the time I was spending five to six hours a day on Stormfront reading posts and, and getting to know those folks. 
and it was at the exact same time that Trump was starting his campaign. I remember actually being on Stormfront the day that he made those comments about the border and about Mexico. And what you saw on that message board that day was he blew it. He, you know, uh, everybody's going to think he's a racist. He's never going to get elected. I can't believe, you know, he came out like that. And then over the course of the next week, Trump doubled down. He said he stood behind that and that he doesn't understand why other people think it's a problem. And you actually saw this community realize that American culture had changed and that if you framed the issue of white nationalism as a problem of immigration, you could kind of let it happen. They kept saying, like, let it happen. Don't get in the way. Don't make this about white nationalism. Bring it up at work. Go to the Trump rally. And so over time, you saw these groups start to become invested in a politics that, for the most part, none of them were really Republicans. Like, they weren't bought into any system or party or candidate. And why that matters is because we have to think about the political opportunities that are both uh, about the kinds of political culture that we have and then those technological capacities that the internet uh, and especially social media has brought. And what I saw throughout that moment was, uh, you know, this idea that everything open will be exploited, which is they would go on to... Uh, they would talk about, you know, making some fake accounts on Twitter or whatever, and just trying to like amp up the conversation around immigration. And then if you were had questions about the conversation around immigration, it, they were one of your entry points. And you may not know that you're talking to white nationalists about it, but, you know, and, and we saw this happen time and time again, where social media companies had no idea how different groups were using their platforms and they had no idea the kind of coded language and messaging that these um, these far right groups were using in particular. I mean, the moment a group like that knows they're being moderated, they change the spelling of what it is. Uh, you know, so leak spe speak, like this idea that you replace an I with a one and an a, a G with an eight. Um, or like uh, using the word juice, J-U-I-C-E, instead of saying the Jews, like moderation is circumventable and turns into a kind of game for a lot of these um, posters. There's an infamous uh, Twitter account that's up to number like 66. He just numbers his accounts every time he gets banned and, and does another one. Um, and so moderation is, of course, part of the solution, but it's also about the culture and the user base and what kind of resources you put into curation that are going to matter. So I've sort of jokingly put out there that, you know, tech industry needs to hire 10,000 librarians to sort out their information problem. But the more that I think about it, if we had librarians who cared about information integrity and genre at the table when these systems of recommendation and trending and search are being built, you actually get different ontologies built into the systems and you get different output. And the one thing that I think, you know, we all know about media manipulators is that they benefit from the instability of these either trending or search uh, because what they need to do is just make content that goes burr, right? Like they just need to whip it through the system as fast as they can. And so they often piggyback it on either a breaking news event or somebody who's getting, you know, canceled or whatnot. Um, and so for us, it's like, how do you build durability into the search system so that uh, or into trending so that people can't manipulate it by just either overwhelming it with a bunch of content on a keyword that is just getting kind of attention. And how do you then fortify it by having a curation strategy that favors timely, local, relevant, and accurate information over what's popular? And that's, you know, the 
that to me requires a different framework for operating your uh, company than just trying to solve the problem by saying, I have a commitment to free speech. Because I also have a commitment to free speech, but I also have a commitment to the truth. I, I believe access to the truth is a human right. And if you're gonna run the largest search engine in the world, then you have to have a commitment to truth and a plan for that. And if you don't, it's suspect. So I guess two things. One, there's many librarians in the audience, so I'm sure they, they love to hear that. Um, and then I think this kind of plays right into the next question, which I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to mix it with some of the audience questions. So, you know, my, usually when this happens, we talk about content moderation and then people are like, oh, well, we can't trust the companies to really do a good job at it. And so then regulation comes into play. Should we have a government come in and regulate social media? So that was my original question. What do you think about regulation coming into play? But then sort of tying this into some of the audience questions, we have a question here about how, um, you know, doing content moderation relates to First Amendment rights of free speech. So um, sort of tying these together, you know, what do you think? Do you think regulation is something that should happen for social media content moderation? And how does that relate to other rights like free speech as you brought up, John? Well, the main, the main point that I'll make, which I think ties to a comment that Jeremy made earlier, was about the role of content moderation. So, and to, jo to Joan's point about content moderation is easily circumventable. You know, that's, that's clearly 100% true. And just from the, like, the, the, all the examples that we have don't even address the issues of like using imagery as a way to express, uh, to express harassment. Like I, could, I might say, hey man, I love you and then show you a picture that's like clearly violent and, and, and threatening in some way. And that's even harder to deal with because we need to then have like image processing capabilities and image understanding, which is clearly a hard problem. But that's one way that you can view content moderation. Another way you can view content moderation that I would argue is not reactive, is about how you can use content moderation to establish norms of the platform. It's like, we know that child pornography is not welcome on these platforms and we know that it's illegal, but the platforms, nev have ne it's never been a question of like a free speech thing. It's just, it's not welcome here and we're gonna have to take actions to it. And that's a very clear, like obvious example on the extreme side. But one of the things that I like about YouTube's, YouTube's approach to their moderation capabilities, they don't necessarily delete content from their platform, though they, they do delete some, but their role in, or their ability to de-recommend or suppress particular kinds of content removes the financial incentive to create that content. So to Joan's point about, you know, I can hop on a trending topic and then push my, uh, push my message. You know, we see this in crisis informatics. An earthquake happens in Nepal and now everybody's talking about the earthquake, even though like 30% of them are using it to like drive traffic to their online pharmacy or t-shirt company. Uh, and it's because there's a financial incentive to like, jump on to those topics. So if you as a platform can use the, your moderation capability, not just to like try and bring the band hammer down when somebody says something about, uh, about Holocaust denial, but to demonstrate that, well, Holocaust denial will be suppressed on our platform. We won't delete it, but you won't make money from it. I think there's a huge value in that. Yeah, I, me, for me, like as I talk about incentives to do hate speech, incitement, harassment, there's one thing where people are ideologically wedded to it, right? Like this is a moral commitment that they've made and they're going to do it um, sort of by any means necessary. The financial incentives have actually been introduced in a really um, strange and interesting way. If you think about the history of YouTube, it was really content creators and other kind of mid-level industry people that were saying, we don't want to be putting content up for free on your platform. You can at least have a profit sharing uh, model that'll help us make our content and it'll be great. You know, YouTube makes money from ads. We make a little bit of money. It's a mutually beneficial 
uh, prosumer, you know, relationship, producer consumer relationship. And so that business model comes out of a, a kind of social good, like, let's not, you know, make all like YouTube was like, okay, we understand we got to share some of the profits. But what that did was actually incentivize a bunch of these folks that, you know, from my generation, you would have called them shock jocks. Like these are the people that get onto local radio and they just say crazy things. And you're just like, oh man, like you're a disgusting misogynist. Uh, I hate that you're on the radio. Right. And then you'd have civil society kind of try to do their petitions to get you taken down. And, and the more people kicked up dust that you were a terrible, bad man, the better it was for your image, the better it was for your radio show. And so we've been here. We, we, we know this. However, with YouTube, it's much more diffused. It's much more distributed. And those that I've noticed, those that get their YouTube account struck and taken down, uh, before they get taken down, if they get a strike for hate speech or hate content, they change. Um, you know, and like, I'm thinking here about the phenomenon, Jeremy probably was in the thick of it as I was in 2017 around this notion of blood sports. So these were debates that were happening on YouTube through like far right influencers, even some lefty tubers were jumping in being like, I can debate a Nazi, but everyone was making money. I did a article with, um, Buzzfeed about this, Craig Silverman, about the money being made, you know, eight, 10 grand a night hosting one of these blood sports where, you know, white nationalists, whoever would go up against some gamer game streamer that just wanted to, to make a few bucks. But this became a kind of incentive in an industry to spread hate speech and to kind of traffic in this stuff. And not for, if not for journalism at that stage, calling attention to it and saying, hey, these people are making money off your platform, probably little would have gotten done. I know civil society had been raising alarms about it and we're getting nowhere, um, which is to say that the business model and the profit sharing model also uh, incentivizes some of this bad behavior. And when they started to lose access to live streaming and super chats, they went to other contents, like they just started covering other things. Um, and there was a really great article in the Washington, no, Wall Street Journal by Yuri Ko, who was a journalist covering this, that, um, that did get some of these streamers taken down. But unfortunately, as a journalist, when she wrote that story, she became a target of harassment, had to shut down her own social media uh, they were trying to dig into her parents and her family. I mean, it was not good. And so the other thing that happens, I think, that we don't talk a lot about is the collateral damage to journalists and researchers and folks and civil advocates that the moment you take on these issues, you become the target, not the company that is facilitating uh, the payment for hate and radicalization and i and i would love to see some more attention paid to that especially in terms of journalists because this is a known known journalists women 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 of color don't want to be on the hate beat just as women don't want to be on the the, the abortion beat either because if the moment you publish about that uh, people threaten to kill you and it's horrible um, and so there's a lot to unpack there, but it's all to say that if platform companies did a better job, the true costs wouldn't be passed on to the rest of us mm -hmm. uh, because it would stop before we had to ask for an intervention. Right. So really quickly, I want to I want to scoop in a question real quick and then get to the audience ones because uh, we're close to running out of time. I want to target this one specifically at Jeremy, and I think this is really actually very related to what Joan was just talking about. Let's say hypothetically that you know mainstream platforms like Facebook, Twitter, et cetera, did a great job at content moderation. Like all of a sudden they're doing a perfect job. Um, do you think this actually solves our problem, or do you think you know fringe platforms sort of come in and take the role that uh, is currently being facilitated on something like Facebook? I yeah, I, I think that this is the the one of the core questions about the moderation is if Facebook, Twitter, you know, even Reddit, whoever cleans up their stuff, 
it, just people just make a clone and that's it so yeah there we've done some work looking at this kind of you know reddit has done a good job reddit's a really good example of banning really bad communities um that are there's very few people that would say hey this isn't a violent radical community that needs to be dealt with uh and all they do is they go off and they spin up their own reddit clone so yes they have a less audience their audience is smaller their reach is smaller reddit is a cleaner place um but then they can show signs of increasing radicalization because now there's no outside influence moderating influence at all um and it's not that hard to just spin up a it's not that hard to spin up a, a, a social media platform like the software that can handle a relatively small group, you know, uh, tens, thousands, maybe a hundred thousand people. That's, it's not that hard these days. So that's, that's like kind of where I think that, that, that a real risk here is, is, is these platforms, even if they do have their, their moderation policies, if we, even if we do have some kind of magic, perfect regulation, um, it's, it's kind of like, you know, you can't close your eyes to everything else going on. Yeah, and I'll piggyback on that because I mean it's an interesting question about you know what's the role of these of the mainstream platforms and are they by banning a lot of these content producers creating a new market for these fringe platforms mm -hmm. and in some sense I think that's probably true and it's like follow the money kind of thing because you know I, I there's clearly an information vacuum I can address it by creating a new platform on the flip side I'll say you know you can't like from a content moderation perspective you can't address or solve the problem of people who are already interested in this content. But what you can do, and I continue to contend, is that you can reduce the opportunity for people who have not been exposed to this content to be exposed. Because like, you know, if, I, if I'm spending a lot of time on Facebook, but all of this other content's been pushed off to like 12chan or 28chan or 66chan or whatever, I either have to somehow know about that in order to make it to that platform or some, somebody I know has to invite me or like, I have to be exposed to know that's a thing that I can, that I can go to. Uh, so from an incentive standpoint and, and an exposure standpoint, I think the platforms doing like being perfect at this would be great and it would be great pro-socially. Will it solve the whole problem? Clearly not, because that's, that's, that problem's a socio-technical problem that can't be solved just by technology. I just I want to jump in on on some of those points because I think Jeremy is 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 really getting at one of the fundamental things that uh, is driving innovation on the web in a very strange way, which is to say that uh, for many, many years, Facebook just bought up things and killed them. Uh, and we now have a, a very a big lack of competitive products out there that could either distribute, you know, the information burden to other places uh, that could create revenue streams for other folks that are interested in doing better curation and moderation and, and, and better community management. And instead, what you have is, well, you either use Facebook or you don't. And then if you don't, the options are essentially companies whose PR strategy is we take all kinds and we actually like it if you're, you know, so pro free speech that you think it covers harassment, you think it covers insurrection you think it covers um incitement and so parlor has been a kind of has been interesting in the sense that they're trying to write their content moderation policy right now and they've issued a few different um uh, versions of it one is a very short version that i think they hope their readers read that is basically like we don't think we should be moderating your content but if you're using it to do crimes we're gonna have to but then the longer version of their terms of service is like, you can't impersonate people, you can't use bots. It, it actually kind of mimics a lot of the stuff we see on the other platforms, um, which goes to show that, um, as Jeremy was pointing out, the, the CEO, the marketing strategy is really how people learn the rules of the platform. And then that's how they expect to engage in it. Now, um, 
one thing that we haven't talked about, which is interesting, is the kind of net war that plays out when you have less rules, which is to say that one of the most destructive tendencies of 4chan is the way in which it keeps out normal folks by posting torture, nudity, uh, beheadings, swastikas, all the gross stuff is like loaded into every thread as a, as a kind of, you know, warning sign, stay out. Um, that to me is something that we're probably going to end up seeing at, on some of these other uh, social, alternative social media platforms as a way to keep, you know, I mean, Back in 2016, it was to keep out the normies. This, these days, it would be to keep out the boomers. Um, but, you know, I think that there is a, a problem here where uh, innovation really lacks uh, foresight and ingenuity and probably resources and funding as well to do um, social media at scale that puts community safety as the main feature. Um, and I know that Ethan Zuckerman is doing a lot of work to try to um, do the research to figure that out. And I'm kind of excited about what he might learn. Great. So we could talk about this all day. I, I really enjoy listening to the three of you talk about this. Um, we have about three minutes left. So I'm going to try to grab a few audience questions here. Uh, so this is a question from Zane, who's in my 201 class. So shout out to the 201 class. Um, he's asking... Um, you know, how can this content moderation be accomplished um, globally, right? So we kind of talked, we briefly talked a little bit about regulation and we're sort of viewing this in the lens of January 6th capital riots, which is a, a US event. Um, but what does this look like globally, right? The, if regulation was to step in, you know, that's one country at a time. So is this something that's possible globally? I. I I can speak specifically from a technical point of view. So regulation is what it is. Um, I can say that from a technical point of view, there there is evidence that whatever solution is going to have to be uh, culturally uh, specific or, or at least uh, take it into account. So we, we did, for example, looking at toxicity in video games, and you can clearly see that the norms were different in Korea, in Europe, in the US. So this type of what is acceptable norms uh, is going to be different every place. And that means that technical solutions are not going to be one size fit all. So when regulation does come into play, if it does, that's what's going to be super interesting is this divide between how the, how the hell does Facebook do meet every regulation and all these different companies because there is no one stop uh, technical solution. So I, that's a comment there. Like uh, even from a technical point of view, I have no idea how we're going to do it. Yeah, it's a really hard problem because like in some sense, this is a, you could view this as a techno, techno imperialism problem. Like who are we to say that you know, our technology needs to be used this particular way in a culture that is separate from our own? But at the same time, how can you also be comfortable with the idea that you know, then F Facebook or some technology that's housed in the United States is being used to, uh, to uh, perpetrate atrocities or, or repress an entire population or an entire gender? Uh, which is something that you may have to allow if you're trying to say, well, only people within a particular culture should be, the, should have the ability to moderate the platform or say what the norms of the platform should be for that particular culture. I don't know how to solve that problem. Yeah, you know, our research, you know, the media manipulation casebook uh, at mediamanipulation.org has a few different um, international case studies. And what it's really pointed us to is how important it is to understand the ways that political elites and moneyed individuals are going to use social media uh, as a way to oppress citizens. Like, that's just true. So now that we know it, what do we do about it, right? And I think that there are, there's, uh, Gabby Lim on my team has really started to look at all these different fake news laws, which are really about suppressing journalists that are dissenting from the state. And I think tech has always viewed itself as somehow being outside of the state and contrarian. But I think now after a decade of social media, 
um, and knowing, you know, who Zuckerberg and Dorsey and, and uh, Pachai have, have, you know, kind of made strange bedfellows with in terms of political leaders, we have a serious problem on our hands. Uh, which is to say that fundamentalists and and far right extremists and um, uh, are reaping the benefits of being able to reach the population uh, very quickly and control media narratives, especially about groups that are marginalized, groups that are voiceless. Um, you know. In our fields, racialized disinformation is something that we need to be studying. And at the same time, very few researchers are putting it at the forefront of their research agenda because it's a difficult thing to study and it requires us to look at, well, what are the domestic operations that are happening that are um, essentially blanketing the net with uh, negative and harassing content uh, about black advocacy orgs and black journalists. And so as I think about this and I think about how social media shapes foreign relations and how our field of disinformation is shaped by the kinds of data sets that the companies want us to look at and the kinds of ways that they want us to say this is a foreign problem. Um, I look to other researchers in other countries for help and guidance because I, you know, is a sour way to end this, but it's all very bad. And it's very bad because people have a lot of money at stake and the rest of us are paying for it, right? The rest mm -hmm. of us are the ones that have to try to figure out, oh yeah, like how is this group being maligned online and who's behind it? And and what features of this platform are they using? And how are they using this other platform? And and who's getting paid out for that? And so I, I feel like our field really needs to come together um, and seriously come at the problem as one of shifting power away from state, away from tech companies um, in such a way that, that protects uh, the people who have to, you know, the rest of us have to use the internet. Like we can't just sh mm -hmm. shut off our devices and pretend like it doesn't exist. This is, this is our economy now. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that's a great point to end on. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Um, so in, in summary, um, there's a lot of bad things happening, but this is the importance of information professionals and interdisciplinary work to uh, try to solve these problems, you know, head on. Um, so I, I think uh, Courtney wanted to jump in and talk about the, this afternoon session, um, but I, I really want to thank the three panelists for their time. I wish we could have talked for another hour. Uh, this is very easy conversation uh, about difficult topics. So I really thank you all for your time. And if Courtney's not going to jump in, I can just say um, there is another afternoon session at 3.30 on tips and tricks of the influencer economy. So uh, feel free to jump into that. That'll be another uh, great session. If you have other questions, feel free to email me and I uh, will give you the best answer I can and or maybe loop in some of the panelists. If you're in my 201 class, ask it on Friday. That will be helpful for discussion. So thank you, everyone. Thanks. Have a good one. Peace.